Hello, my name is Nupa Patel and I am a DEFL student at the University of Oxford and I'm studying medieval and modern languages. And today I'll be presenting a paper called Catherine Desroches, Reshaping Lives and the Quest for an Afterlife in Langnaudis and Limoussi. Literature is a powerful site of contemplation in which a number of writers can explore the meaning of life and its value. Catherine Desroches uses imaginative writing as a space to explore her own life. A talented hostess, poet and writer in 16th century Poitiers, her and her mother, Madeleine Desroches, produced Les Oeuvres, Les Secondes Oeuvres and Les Missives, collections of poetry and prose, and in Les Missives, their individual correspondences. They were known collectively as the Dame des Roches, but this did not mean that their styles of writing were uniform. Catherine's understanding of life is a central theme in her own distinct writing. She uses it to navigate her own position in her contemporary society and beyond. My paper explores this theme of life, which is divided into two parts. Firstly, I consider the ways in which Catherine creates an ideal and exemplary life using the figure of Agnodis. Reflecting on her own mythological tale of Lagnudis, we locate a desire on Catherine's part to, to pursue her own exceptional life as an unmarried and childless scholarly woman, and to provide more opportunities for women to pursue an education. Secondly, an examination of Catherine's literary afterlife in her correspondence with printer Abel Lalongier. Lalongier. Oh. La Langelier <laughs> reveals an interest on Catherine's part to live beyond the grave. I argue that her fictional writing reveals itself to be an important space to contemplate her life and her desires. The birth of her artistic progeny helps to create an afterlife for herself. She demonstrates the possibility for literature to be an empowering medium through which she may have a life that will live beyond her lifetime. One of the most intriguing moments in which Catherine addresses aspects of her own life takes place in her Lagnodis, based on Gaius Julius Hyginus's tale of the mythological woman in medicine. Kendall Tart has argued that Lagnodis is an allegory of Catherine's role in salon society. In agreement with this, I find traces of Catherine's and her mother's local Poitevin salon which I argue allows her to allegorize the condition of her own contemporary experience. She mirrors her own salon and transforms it into an ideal fictional salon in which women's learned lives may flourish. She was very much aware of the general suspicion towards female education in the early modern period. Learned women were perceived as alarming for they transgressed the boundaries of their gender by attempting to be educated like men. In response to this, Catherine explores the condition of exceptional learned women like herself. She uses Agnodice as a literary embodiment of herself. Both women are classed among the few women who were recognized for their erudition. Catherine especially sought eternal fame for this. And learning form formed a major part of her life. It takes center stage in Agnodice. In this tale, the allegorical figure of envy encourages husbands to deprive their wives of knowledge, especially of gynecology. The women suffer in silence. They refuse to bear their naked bodies to male doctors in order to retain their modesty. And as a result, they suffer from illnesses. Agnodice dresses up as a man to learn medicine, a male profession in Catherine's day, and she treats these women back to health. The men of her society eventually allow Agnodis to continue her practice after she reveals herself to be a woman. Catherine firstly establishes the common specifications of women who are supposed to be modest. In the face of pudeur or modesty, the women suffer from a number of illnesses, which Catherine suggests becomes a living nightmare for them. Since envy has prevented them from knowing their own bodies, their only option is to reveal their bodies to male doctors, which is against the code of pudeur. A contemporary audience may admire them for their insistence on adhering to social norms. However, Catherine parodies this by indicating this to be wholly negative. She not only parodies masculine discourses of modesty from within, 
she also opposes, transgresses and transcends them with her own take on women's lives. She stresses that the lack of female education has led to the breakdown of feminine solidarity. This notion of a community of women is essential to Guetrin's portrayal of the lives of women in 16th century France and of her own life. Through the figure of Agnodi, she establishes a collective life between women in which they should all follow Agnodi's example and study together and support one another. Here, however, the dire situation of the women in the tale means that they cannot achieve this form of solidarity that Guetrin admires. The women, feeling alienated, resort to spinning in their own private and isolated spaces. They do not necessarily wish to complete domestic duties over learning, but because of the men, they have been forced to do so. Aware of the limits of her gender, Agnodi sets out to change this situation and becomes an androgynous figure. It is here that Catherine creates an ideal life and transforms the perception of monstrous learned women. Hiding behind male clothes, Agnodi enters the male sphere of medicine, or more specifically, knowledge. We see hints of Catherine's personal desire to communicate a strong message to her audience. When referring to Agnodice's character, Catherine compellingly demonstrates her rare vertu, words which are often employed in descriptions about Catherine. Throughout Agnodice, she also stresses the plus digne ornement des beautés, that is learning. Using positive terms to describe Agnodice, she becomes an exemplary figure, one who other women of the time should imitate. Having eventually revealed herself to the women and men, Agnodice is initially suspected of infamy. However, Agnodice's compelling justification for practicing medicine wins them over. Catherine turns nature on its head and suggests that to take learning away from Agnodice and Catherine would be to offense nature, for knowledge makes women more virtuous. Here she expands her personal investment in the story to encompass the plight of all women of her time. Playing on the term autorisé, she sanctions women's wish to learn and reveals her own authority in doing so. The men agree to Agnodice's wishes and Catherine creates an ideal salon in which women are allowed to collaborate in learning. The men therefore transform into salon guests who may admire women like Catherine and Agnodice. Here society allows the learned women to flourish. The salon environment, which Catherine creates in literary form, gives women an imagined space in which their voices are valued. Catherine demonstrates a second benefit of women's education to society through the theme of healing. Knowledge is also praised because the women become healthier and more virtuous. When she reveals herself, the women admire Agnodis. Her body represents trust for them. The women now come together to be united as a community of women. And this act alone suggests a desire on the women's part to follow in Agnodice's footsteps in learning. Catherine Agnodice is a prime example of how a woman writer understands her position in a pre predominantly patriarchal society and finds scope to push against it. Catherine has a personal stake in the depiction of a learned woman's exemplary life. In her fictional salon, which reflects her own salon in Poitiers, she considers her own life and imagines other women's lives similar to her own. Now, beyond her literary works, Catherine's preoccupation with the need to live beyond the grave while she is still alive manifests itself in two different ways. Firstly, creating new lives in the form of literary progeny, and secondly, immortalizing her name. Firstly, as we as we have already seen in Agnodice, an alternative kind of motherhood is a theme with which Catherine is preoccupied. She was an unmarried and childless woman and was determined to remain that way, opting instead to stay by her mother's side and pursue her love of learning. Etienne Pasquier, a participant of the Desroches Salon, once wrote to his friend and lawyer, Pierre Pitou, expressing his and another men's perplexity at Catherine's choice to reject her feminine duty of becoming a wife especially since she, she had gained the affection of numerous admirers. Catherine herself counteracts this concern through maternal imagery. We see this most effectively in her discussion of her version of Claudian's Deraptu Proserpina, entitled Le Ravissement de Proserpine. 
It is a story about the abduction of the mythical Proserpine by Pluto. In her letter to Abel Langelier, the printer of her correspondence, Le Missive, Catherine identifies Le Ravissement as her own figurative offspring. She notes that La fille de Cerit dés désire en espérance to find Langelier, an honorary parrain, to protect her in the male public printing sphere. In light of Catherine's situation, the bookish child topos becomes a means of validating her own life. As a voluntarily childless woman, Catherine establishes a comparison between birthing and creating art. She presents a kind of slippage within the common discourse of motherhood, pushing the boundaries of how women can be a mother without physically giving birth. She seems maternal without compromising her wish to stay unmarried. This compensation is to reassure her public that she remains loyal to gender norms by carrying out her duty as a woman. She figuratively continues the family line for her as well as her mother, Madeleine. This notion of literary motherhood, a commonly used topos during the 16th century, is also effective in its ability to pass down Catherine's name to future generations. It is clear that Catherine is very much interested in imagining an afterlife for herself. In her dedication to her mother in Les Oeuvres, she explicitly states her wish to be remembered as one of the nombre de peu, one of the few women who write and print their works during the 16th century. She is very aware of her talent for writing and seeks eternal fame as her own mother wished for her. By producing literary offspring, her works give her the means to leave something for prosperity beyond her own lifetime and to entrench herself in the memory of present and future writers. Ultimately, Catherine's works offer her a way of thinking about the potential for literature to shape life and create new possibilities, including the realization of a writer's own immortality. Using life as a category to explore the works of a woman writer in print like Catherine, we can perhaps unearth a set of moves that other women writers of the time may make to comprehend their own positions and reimagine new ones.